Please turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 145. Psalm 145, the book of Psalms is right smack dab in the middle of the Bible, so you should be able to open up in the middle and find our passage. So this past week, we concluded cover to cover in 100 days. There was much, uh, much rejoicing at that. We had over 600 people on this journey. I'm happy to say that the vast majority have completed it, and many more are finishing it up. As we said several times over during the course of it, cover to cover in 120 days is just as good as 100 days. So if you are still finishing up, just keep swimming, Dory. Just keep swimming, keep reading, get it done. If you know somebody who's still reading, encourage them to the finish line. So our final session, we had a time for people to share testimony, share about how God had been at work to share what their next steps were. And it was a reminder that our goal at MPC is to be moving ever closer to Jesus and deeper in his word. We want deep roots in God's truth. We want his story to be the one that guides ours. God's story that helps us make sense of our own story and the story of what's going on around us. So if you know someone who did cover to cover, I would encourage you to ask them about it. What did they learn about God? What surprised them as they read through the Bible cover to cover? One of my favorite comments from somebody in the Tuesday night group was that reading it this way demystified the Bible. Demystified the Bible. Now reading the Bible is like the Mount Everest for Christians. We all want to do it, but it seems completely impossible, right? But it is possible. If you're only reading a paragraph at a time, it can be impossible. But there are ways to do it differently. And if you've never done it before, I would encourage you to talk to someone who has and ask them how it went. So two weeks ago, we kicked off our new sermon series on our church's core values, focusing on the first of them, the most important one, the cornerstone of our whole identity, and that is Jesus first. We hunger to grow closer to Jesus, deeper in his word. Everything we do begins and ends with him. We were reminded that we want to be a church with momentum. And what that looks like is that we are a community filled with people who are taking one step closer to Jesus week by week. A church filled with people who are moving closer to Jesus weekly. So last week we talked a bit about why these core values are important, why we're talking about them, and I want to revisit that. How many of you know someone in your life who blows up over small things? Who gets a little, uh, a little angry over trivial things? I won't ask you if you're sitting on the same pew as them. But we all have people like that in our life who are willing to go to the mats over the smallest things. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever noticed this, but churches are notorious for having big fights over little things. Big fights over petty things. Not that churches ever have fights or conflict, but it's not unusual when we do for them to be over petty things. Anyone ever seen this? Anybody ever been a part of this? So in our Presbyterian tradition, in order to become an ordained pastor, you have to take a series of ordination exams. They are typically long essay format, and they focus on different topics like conflict resolution, theology, worship, polity, and governance. Riveting things, right? Riveting things. If you know Wendy Greer, she is in the middle of her ordination exams in this season, and you can be sure to stop and tell her, we're praying for you and encourage her because they aren't easy. Now, most of those exams are given in the form of a case study, and I want to share with you uh, one of my favorites. One of my favorites, okay? So, David and Hannah, here's how it's presented. David and Hannah are on the worship committee. The worship committee decided they needed to replace the worn-out, old, discolored carpet in the sanctuary that is red with a nice, new, beautiful beige carpet. Beige carpet. And they got it on sale. Very excited about that. So they replace it. They go to the next gathering of elders, the next session meeting, and they surprise everyone with a resolution to be voted on. 
saying we should switch in our communion from using red grape juice to white grape juice. Why? So that it doesn't stain the carpet. So it doesn't stain the new carpet. Now, now then, if you're taking the exam, it's presented to you as this case study that now the elders are conflicted, they don't know what to do, and they look to you to give any theological insight and biblical insight on whether you use red grape juice or white grape juice. Now, I'm not going to tell you the answer to that question, the resolution to it, but I love that story because we love our carpet colors, don't we? We love things like that. Churches are notorious for having big fights over petty and trivial things. It didn't even get into the people who probably lost their lives over changing the color of the carpet in the sanctuary, right? So back in Houston, I worked with a half dozen individuals or groups who were planting new churches in the city and around the city. One of the leaders gave me an incredible insight. He said, when we go to plant a church, we remember that we are not planting churches. We are planting the gospel in a neighborhood. We are planting Jesus in a neighborhood. Now, when I think of church plants, when I envision in my mind a church plant, I envision a little institution, right? A a little church clone baby that looks like our building or some sort of church building in the middle of a neighborhood. But what we're really doing is we are planting the gospel. We are planting the good news and we're letting the Holy Spirit start something new. The church is not the building. The church is the people. Church is not something that you go to. You are the church wherever you go. So as we look at our core values, we want to be mindful of who we are beyond our carpet color, our location, our worship styles, even our coffee and donuts. Who we are beyond what people merely see. We are a community where Jesus always comes first and is lifted up higher than everything else. He is the cornerstone of our identity and thus our first core value. Our second value has to do with the makeup of our community, and it is this. Every generation, we disciple all generations to follow Jesus and recognize that each is essential in the body of Christ. Now, some of you may seem like this is incredibly obvious and even silly, but I want us to stop and think about it for a minute. One of the things I love about our church is that when you walk through our campus at any point on Sunday morning, you will see every generation. You will see people in their 90s, their 80s, their 70s, their 20s, their teens. You will see infants and every generation in between. Where else do you go where you see all the generations gathered together regularly, weekly, and growing in community? Now, I would contend that the vast majority of churches, when you walk in, you only see one shade of hair color. You either see all gray hair or you see all dark hair, but rarely do you see a mix. So in American culture, we are masters of segmenting the population and targeting certain groups. So many marketing strategies and church strategies as well, they thrive on this. And on the target end of those strategies, we love it. We love it when people give us what we want the way we want it. We've been groomed to be consumers even in the church. So what we end up with are churches that are all old people or churches that are all young people. But when you come to MPC, you see all the generations. It's not unique to us, but it is rare. So I want you to hear from a couple of our families about what worshiping across the generations means to them. I'm Walter Weaver and Cindy, my wife Cindy, and we've been members of uh, Manor Presbyterian Church for 31 years now. Yep, we started in October uh, 1993. 
and now we're very happy to have uh, both our son-in-law and uh, granddaughter, Caroline, who, who attend church now. I have been attending Manor Presbyterian for about three years full time and off and on since my wife and I have been together um, with her family and ours. Um, and then full time with our beautiful little daughter here for, I guess, about four months now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Laura Salmon and I've been attending Mariner and Presbyterian since I was two. So over th almost 30 years through my middle school and high school small group leaders. Um, I think having them volunteer and make an impact on me what makes me want to then, as she grows up, volunteer and pour into her generation. I would say for me on a Sunday to Sunday basis, it's just seeing uh, friends of my grandparents singing in the choir to sitting next to my dad in the service to watching my daughters help my mom serve coffee in between services to everybody coming in for the 1030 and um, you know just seeing a little aspect of every generation all there building that sense of community. We're Bobby and Vicki Gillander and we have three children um, who all grew up in the church. Uh, I've been a member here for 45 years um, I've been a member for 60. I came to the church when I was 10 years old with my parents and uh, never left. The younger generations are our future and without the truth that's not much of a future and that'll be found in the church. And for the older generations I think um, it prevents a complacency. Uh, it, it encourages, it encourages uh, boldness and courage to prepare for the future, to see the younger generations coming along. We had the opportunity last year to participate in the awakening and just watching those youth grow and share and open up and have fun doing it was for me just indescribable. It's really special that people that have known Tripp since he was a tiny baby come up to my children and love on them like they've known them forever. And my kids feel seen. I think feeling seen is a really important um, aspect to breeding longevity in being in a church setting. Um, not feeling like you're just in the masses. Uh, so that multi-generational aspect really breeds that. I have always known I wanted to bring my children up in the church, just having grown up in the church myself. Um, a lot of my memories growing up really go back to the church. I don't really have a memory growing up that doesn't involve church somehow. So I always knew that that was how I wanted to bring my children up. And um, just over the past few months, having Caroline join us, it's been, such a joy watching her worship in her own way as her little six month old self. Um, but I think starting at a young age, that's just something that I have always wanted for my children. Thank you to the Gillanders and the Weavers and the Salmon families for doing that for us and sharing with us. So in that video, we saw representatives from almost all the generations. So the builders, the boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, also known as millennials, Gen Z, maybe there was somebody in Gen Z, I'm not sure. We definitely saw Gen Alpha who are our youngest. If you Google generational differences, each of those different generations has unique characteristics, unique strengths, Unique weaknesses, unique anxieties as well. There's no shortage of analysis out there. Just think about the way each of those generations receive new music. How many of you actually recognize what all those are? You have the transition from records, from vinyl, to 8-tracks, to cassette tapes, to CDs, MP3 players, to live streaming, and now we're back at what? Records, 2023, over 43 million vinyl albums were sold. Isn't that amazing? Everything old is new again, right? 
Each of those iterations of music represents eras with huge monumental events and changes that are often expressed through the music. And as you see those, some of those memories and some of those eras come back to mind. Generational studies is a fascinating subject. But here's the thing. Our society, our marketing specialists, our academic and political elites, they analyze and divide the generations. But God's family brings them together. Look around you. Worship brings all of the generations together. The gospel, the good news, brings all of us into orbit around our creator God, no matter our age, our savior Jesus, in a way that nothing else does, and in a way that breathes a common life into us, a life abundant through everyone from the youngest to the oldest. We believe that the richness of our community is enhanced when All the generations from the oldest to the youngest are maturing in their walk with Jesus. And our passage this morning frames it well. So let's take a look at it. Psalm 145. I'm going to read the first seven verses out loud. You can follow along in your Bibles or on the screen. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One generation commends your works to another. We all need to read that again in the first person. My generation commends your works to another generation. So if you are a 10-year-old or 13-year-old, if you are in your teenage years, that means you commend to the old people and to the little kids the awesome works of our God. And if you're 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 or anything in between, it's talking to you too. So I want us to look again at this passage in the first person, and I want to invite us to read it out loud together. Here it is. There we go. There we go. So join me in reading it together. My generation commends your works to another. We tell of your mighty acts. We speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. We tell of the power of your awesome works. We will proclaim your great deeds. We celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Now, not to pick on the Gillanders and the Weavers, but I know that all of the grandparents in that video just finished reading the Bible cover to cover, and I hope at some point those little grandchildren will hear them say something like this. You know, I've been reading the Bible my whole life, and you may not believe this, but I'm still learning new things about myself about God, about his creation. You can spend a lifetime of reading God's word and never plumb the depths of its beauty and truth. We commend the wonder of God's word from one generation to another. As we sought to express what this core value means in the life of our church One of the phrases that was important to our elders in our session that we honed in on was this. Every generation is called to serve and sacrifice for the benefit of the other generations. Creating a culture of mutual support and care. So a healthy church is one in which the generations sacrifice and serve one another. We could reread that statement in the first person again. It would sound like this. My generation is called to serve and sacrifice 
for the benefit of the other generations. And this is a truth for every generation to claim, but when we're honest, we have to ask the question, where does this start? Where does it start? The process of commending God's works from generation to generation begins with older generations. Now keep in mind that every generation is an older generation as long as there is one younger than you. Younger generations learn how to sacrifice and serve others from how older generations model that for them. So that can be a teenager learning from a 25-year-old. It can be a teenager learning from an 80-year-old. It can be a 40-year-old learning from a 60-year-old. Psalm 78 describes it this way. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they in turn would tell their children, then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. So if you are in a generation in which you are old enough to be expected to pay your own insurance, this is for you. If you model a faith that is focused on the self, what I want and the way I want it, then we should expect the younger generations to do the same and eventually take it a step further or even discard it. Every generation is called to serve and sacrifice for the benefit of the other generations. Something that Pastor Jen says often and said last week, and she does a great job cultivating it in our Next Generation Ministries, is this. We are a church that is for each other. The different generations are for each other. How are our youngest generations going to learn what it looks like to be for the generations that come after them? It's by our older generations choosing to be all in for them. So there's a class for parents that meets during the 9 a.m. service in Quad 1. And in their study last week, the speaker said this. If we don't disciple the next generation the world would love to do it for us. If we don't disciple the next generation, the world would love to do it for us. If you are a youth, a child, a young adult, an older adult, a middle-aged adult who has benefited from, from or been mentored by someone that's older than you, be sure to thank them. They didn't do it, so that you could be indebted to them or because they wanted something from you, they did it freely. So say thank you to them. So as your elders wrestled with these core values, we shared uh, passages from Scripture that came to mind as we read through uh, the sticky note comments and all these core values and all these phrases and things like that. Now one of your elders uh, is Carol Yelenek. Who knows Carol? Carol is someone who I look up to in our congregation who I have learned from. And she shared this passage with us as we wrestled with this value from, from Psalm 71. Since my youth, God, you have taught me. And to this day, I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, Lord, do not forsake me till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Isn't that beautiful? Our culture wants to segment and divide the generations. And particularly, I think, brand the older people as full of outdated opinions and black coffee. But here's the truth. You are a library of stories of God's faithfulness. You're a library of stories about God's faithfulness. And even if you're not old, 
When you go on a mission trip and you come back and you share this summer or you share in worship or you share with kids, you are coming back a library of stories of God's faithfulness. And whether you have three or four generations that are younger than you or only a couple, they need to hear those stories about our amazing God. It says, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, Lord, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. So what are we willing to sacrifice to serve other generations? What are we willing to sacrifice? Are we willing to sacrifice our music? Are we willing to sacrifice that specific seat on the specific pew where you sit every single Sunday? We watch you. We know these things. We have you mapped out. What are we willing to sacrifice so that the next generation hears the gospel? I get it. None of us like change, but in order for the church to reach generation after generation after generation, it requires leaders and servants who are willing to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, to welcome and love the other generations without compromising the gospel and scripture. That means that the things that are most important to me and the things that I love the most will likely one day be artifacts that need to be moved into storage in order for someone else to hear the gospel. And I need to be okay with that. So I am 45 years old. I am at an age where my tastes and my preferences are quickly calcifying and becoming rigid. I'm becoming more obstinate in what I want, what I like, and how I like those things. Spouses call it stubborn. The Bible calls it stiff-necked. Hospitals call it rigor mortis. When churches get reduced to petty, stubborn squabbles over trivial things, they are in the doom loop. And that is why core value number one is so important. We have to keep Jesus at the center of it all. In a hundred years, when I hope your grandkids and your great-grandkids and your great-great-grandkids are worshiping here at Mandarin Presbyterian Church, the most important thing will be that we are still a community filled with people who are seeking to take a step closer to Jesus each week, seeking to grow deeper in his word. That's what will last. That's what's important. So what are you willing to sacrifice in order for the next generation to hear the good news? What are you willing to give in order to provide the space for us to welcome the littlest ones into our fellowship so they can hear the gospel about Jesus Christ? How are you commending God's works to other generations? The ones younger than you and the ones older than you. But let's focus in on our youngest and most dependent generations. Pastor Jen, last week, she not, she not only said we are a church that is for others, but she said we are for families and we are championing families, especially in a culture that is increasingly working against us, right? So when we think about those youngest and most dependent generations, how are you serving and giving in such a way that they know you are for them and above all else want them to hear the good news about a savior who loves them and calls them his sons and daughters would you pray with me Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who is abounding in steadfast love, grace, and mercy. We thank you that from generation to generation, Lord, the 2,000 years of generations between the time 
you walked on the earth till now, you have faithfully carried the gospel through your spirit from generation to generation. Lord, may we be like them. May we be like those who have gone before us who are so sold out for the good news that they sacrificed time, they sacrificed money, they used their talents to make sure that the next generation knew that you were trustworthy, that you are a loving God. So Lord, may we be like them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand and let us worship together.